and welcome. This is Albie with Thinking Outside the Long Box, and we are at San Diego Comic Con. And today I am talking to Nicholas Tanna, the creator of E Junkie, the comic book and graphic novel. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. So I, I, I looked this up a little bit. I haven't read it yet, but I'm very excited to. Um, I'm very intrigued by the whole world that you created. Can you, can you start there and just tell us where this, uh, where this is set? Yeah, it's actually set. I basically basically put it in a futuristic Los Angeles. Okay. So, um, but um, I've actually used real um, addresses and kind of tweaked them for the future and where I where I see things going. Um, but uh, but it's basically in, in a futuristic world. Twenty fifty five is the year. Mm -hmm. um, at this point in time, we've kind of divided the world into zones. There's no more nations, though. Everything's managed by a world corporation organization, which we call in the book the WCO. And um, through the use of emotional regulation technology, there is uh, the ability to control people's emotions, especially the painful ones, the ones that cause suffering. And so there's a sort of world peace and order that's been established through the use of this technology which became very popular after a rising anxiety and depression of just being extremely bombarded with opportunities to do whatever, distractions, games, uh, entertainment. Um, and so that led to uh, a lot of anxiety and depression that eventually led to emotional regulation. And now there's this group called the Guardians of Pain who have decided that you know we need a level of suffering and pain in our lives to grow as humans, to be part mm -hmm. of the human condition, to even want to survive. And they have curated the most painful moments in human history through cellular memory scraping or DNA scraping of corpses. Okay. 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 And so it's sort of a DNA based memory drug that mm -hmm. they have. They've encapsulated in a drug they call torch and they're selling it on the black market. They've reintroduced pain and suffering to a society that's pretty much forgotten it. And now it's starting a revolution. And so the WCO wants it stopped and they hire Hector Holmes, the detective is um, to stop them and trace these guys down and, and, and put an end to this revolution they see coming. And, and Torch, this is, uh, it's painful memories, right? And um, it's addictive, right? So where does that addiction come in? Well, I mean, it's sort of the addiction one would get from a roller coaster ride or from a horror movie, right? Like, why do we put ourselves, why do we subject ourselves mm -hmm. to those things or extreme sports or anything mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. bungee jumping, you know? Like, where mm -hmm. does this adrenaline, the, the, this idea that we're maybe most alive when we, we're nearing death or facing death and our own mortality. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing here, except can you imagine the commodity that is made of pain? It's hard to imagine because we do everything in our culture to stop pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. but can you imagine if you grew up really not knowing it? Now suddenly there's this intrigue, there's that, that rush one gets has been long forgotten. And so that's sort of encapsulated in this drug, Torch. Mm -hmm. Torch. Uh, to me, this has this uh, like Twilight Zone-esque uh, feel to it, like, uh, like a good thing, ending pain and suffering. And, uh, but like what happens if that really happened? And exploring that is uh, going to be amazing. Um, can you tell me about uh, the comic book versus the graphic novel? Sure. Well, basically, the graphic novel is a compilation of about eight issues of comics, okay. which we're originally planning on releasing all eight issues. I'm not sure the publisher is going to do that directly. We may go right from issue one as a collectible to the graphic novel. Part of the reasoning is because the story is very rich, and the, and the graphic novel I'm able to introduce interchapters, much like was done with uh, The Watchmen, so mm -hmm. to speak, you know, where they added more depth to the world and, and information backstory to the central characters or even some of the side characters. I do that with the graphic novel as well. Everything from advertisements to a, a journal of one of the characters to, um, to actually a, a, a newspaper article. It's not really a newspaper article anymore. It's all digital and like, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, but an article on the fall of Hollywood, which is kind of ironic <laughs> these days. Good timing, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And how that happens in part due to lots of new technology and opportunities to entertain. Mm -hmm. um, I know when I'm writing, I have this whole idea of a world or a character in my head, and I'm trying to get it you know, down on paper. And uh, it, you, know, you can never get that full idea of, or it's hard to get that full idea of what you're thinking into the art that you're making. Um, so uh, tell me about your um, uh, in conception of uh, Hector Holmes. Like who he is and who he is in this world. Mm. 
Well, Hector Holmes, all, all of my characters, I do a lot of journaling and story writing and arcing that you'll never see in, mm. in a book, for the most part. I mean, I was able to pull some of that into these interchapters, but you get a tip of the iceberg in terms of this, the story you're going to experience and the story I've created in my head. So Hector Holmes, he interesting guy. I mean, grows up, he's part Hispanic, part um, English. Um, as you can tell by his name, Hector Holmes. Um, he, he grew up uh, in, a, in, a, in a family where um, he, his, his, his mom was a therapist and, and his dad also a psychiatrist. So they're very like, you know, very much about the mind and, and you, know, you know, growing up and, and, and caring for, you know, the, the emotions and the self. Um, but they died tragically in a car accident. Mm -hmm. And he has one brother, and his brother is a central character in the story as well. Um, that um, you, you'll see Jason, and then and then what happens is, growing up, his brothers. He's always Hector's always trying to keep up with his brother. His brother becomes what you call an agent or an alternative reality investigator. Ooh. Those are heiress, um, and he becomes this investigator. Their job is to sort of you know these experiences. If you can imagine being able to tap into other people's memories. Well, what happens is now it's used in like crime, you mm -hmm. know, like you can go into a fallen victim and find out what they, what last happened to them potentially. Mm -hmm. You can, you can use it in terms of like so many things in terms of other people's experience, share what it's like to be a rock star on a stage and mm -hmm. now know what it was like to be that too, you know, from their perspective. So, um, in this world, um, these heiress kind of regulate that because it's pretty obvious that some people could pervert that and then use that in, in, in other ways, you know, where you're taking people's suicidal moments maybe and selling it on the black market, you mm -hmm. know, and just all kinds of creepy things that could be done, you know, with people and those experiences. So the heiress, their job is to kind of mine that and watch that police it, so to speak. So he starts it, but then Hector kind of follows along. He follows his brother. He wants to be good, but he's not as good as his brother. And so he's this you know, all along kind of trying to be as good as his brother, um, not quite as good. Um, and because of the accident, and I don't want to give too much away because it mm -hmm. comes out in the story, but because of the accident, there's this blaming going on back and forth between the two. And, um, and so he's a troubled, um, a bit anxious character, but the difference is his brother wants everything to be right and structured and orderly. Hector's always been a rebel. And so he's sort of this rebel within Eris. And, um, and that's what's interesting. He's sort of this anti-hero who's now all hope lies on him. But he's also willing to go into these very gruesome, horrible experiences because there's this masochistic tendency in him. Okay. Self-punishing kind of sensibility mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that actually helps him be the guy that can brook these painful experiences people aren't used to to look for clues to try stop this uh, cult group. Nice. I like that. Um, when you were writing uh, this story, was there a moment that uh, you reached in the story that you said, "Okay, now I've got it. This is this is what I wanted." There are without many spoiling moments, anything. Many moments where I said, "This is spot. This is okay. so right. It just felt good." Mm -hmm. um, what winds up happening more than anything else? It's like I, I don't know who said that this is this was it. Maybe it was Michelangelo or something. But it's like the statue's there, and you're freeing David from the statue versus creating David. Mm -hmm. It's almost mm -hmm. like it's already written and you're just chipping away and you said, oh yeah, that's right. right. Oh, boop, boop, boop. oh yeah, that's right. Those are the hands, you know? Mm -hmm. And I kind of find that really an interesting analogy to the creative process because I feel like it's almost already written and I'm just finding my way back to it. And that's an interesting experience too because my characters are doing that too. You know, they're literally, when you read the book, they're mm -hmm. finding their way back to their past, maybe a forgotten one even. Um, when when you had the idea for this, do you remember like the circumstances or the day that you were like, oh, do you remember that? There are many many moments. The one one thing I can say is there was sort of a, a dream turned nightmare I had. Okay. Where people were, I was going through this painful experience. It was almost involving aliens, and um, they they were kind of they were basically doing all kinds of experiments on me, and they were using this emotional regulation technology to kind of keep me calm. And I'm like, wow, this is interesting. I'm an experiment with this. This is horrible. But, you know, I'm being calm. It's not so bad. Well, well, you know, I'm like, are they just controlling my mind? And it was this thing that went on in this crazy dream turned nightmare. And that was sort of the, the spawn, the idea, I guess. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, um, I have a lot of experience working in biotechnology. Okay. And I started seeing 
what the drugs and the attempt to use drugs to control our pain and suffering leads to. And with every solution comes more problems. And so I started speculating through story Mm -hmm. What would happen if we've actually, you know that cliche term, make the world a better place? Mm -hmm. What if we succeeded? Would we mm -hmm. really make the world a better place? Right. You know? Kind of like, um, what is it, Captain Kirk says, I need my pain yeah. you know, to be who you are. Uh, so uh, your background kind of explains the genetic memory thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about genetic memory? Do you think that's an actual thing? Because I, I kind of have a feeling that it is. Because there's so many instincts, you know, just to survive. But it, there's got to be also other memories in there, too. Yeah, I actually do believe we have a level of cellular memory. I think it's locked in our DNA. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a matter of evolution and survival. Um, it's, it helps us to recall our ancestors what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. um, Buddhists would call it a bit karma. There's this karma mm -hmm. elements. Um, I studied a lot of meditation and Buddhism over uh, the past eight, nine years now. And, mm -hmm. um, and you, when you do more of that, you kind of almost tap into these mind memories and so the concept of past lives and the concept of this being just one of a dream within a dream mm -hmm. starts to feel real mm -hmm. you know um and it actually enriches one's life mm -hmm. so you don't feel so attached and grasping to one limited lifetime or dream depending mm -hmm. on how you look at it very cool. Yeah. I have uh, like past live memories, but I don't believe in past lives. So it's very confusing to me. So that's why I kind of yeah, went down the. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Because that does make sense. Yeah. Um, and I know yours is uh, like biologically based uh, memories, but uh, like I love the idea of the story because we're kind of as a technological society getting there with the release of the new Apple uh, goggles that it can record. Mm -hmm. So you're getting probably at the very beginning of like recording people's memories and lives like that. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's very timely and I love that idea. Mm -hmm. so There's other tech in there that's really timely. Okay. Um, we're talking a lot about AI, mm -hmm. but not so much about emotional AI. And MIT and certain people are doing much more with emotional AI. Mm. Now, it's somewhat an, an illusion, you know, because it's an artificial yeah. intelligence that's emulating or pretending to be emotional and understand. But in some ways, you know, almost like a therapist, like taking a step out of being, it's almost like the expression, what, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Like, how is that physically possible, mm -hmm. right? It's almost like stepping out of your own issues allows you to see it from a different perspective. And you need someone else that can do that to maybe help you see. If you're one piece of a puzzle, how do you see? You might feel you're connected to other pieces, but you can't see the whole picture, right? Mm -hmm. So it takes that connection or someone outside of that piece to kind of put it together. And um, so emotional AI is how these suits that they wear, the emo regs are, have visors, and you'll notice in the book that they're different colors. Mm -hmm. And green is sort of the homeostasis, the controlled state, right? But they're based on like, psychological color indexes mm -hmm. but um, you know if you get start getting scared you can tell that through color you start getting anxious or or you're lustful or whatever you can start it's full disclosure on emotions yeah. and this is a way also of saying look I'm not gonna offend anyone help keep the peace mm -hmm. we now full disclosure know how everyone's feeling no lying mm -hmm. right um, but is that a good or bad thing you know so so that's all also part of the technology imagine wearing the those mood rings from the 80s you know on your body for all to see wow yeah it's good and bad a lot of, a lot of uh, so b before i read about e-junkie uh the first thing that hit me was this cover art that you're wearing now i saw that first yeah you got to talk about the artist could you tell me a little bit about the artist yeah well the cover artist is different as typical with comics the cover mm -hmm. artist is different from the artist who did the in interior mm -hmm. right in fact i have three different cover artists um, but the main cover artist is Derek Robertson, and um, he's known for The Boys, co-created The Boys oh, series, wow. and Transmetropolitan, which a lot of people that like sci-fi comics mm -hmm. and cyberpunk, it's a really noted book for that, that genre. Mm -hmm. um, I was a fan of it and of him, and so I was so lucky that we've kind of become friendly, and, and he was willing to be a part of this project and contribute such a cool cover. Yeah. And so there's that. And then Kyle um, Fainrich is the artist who did the all the art of the paneling within. Um, and I met him through Mort Castle, who's a really talented horror writer, is part of the Horror uh, Writers Association. Mm -hmm. um, he was, Mort's, I, Mort was um, Kyle's teacher, I believe, in a horror writing class or something. So, so he made the connection. When I told Mort I was looking to develop this as a story, I had a publisher interested, and he was like, Kyle, 
Kyle's your guy. Mm -hmm. um, and Kyle, upcoming, but had that kind of vibe. Uh, he could do that H the Geiger-esque kind of gothic, but mixed with this like neo-cyberpunk Paul Pope style. That's exactly what I needed. And Kyle put it together. That's awesome. It's it's beautiful art. It really Thank is. You. Yeah. Um, There's a couple of variant covers I do want to give kudos to. Daniel Sarah, who does a lot of Clive Barker's books, did this watercolor looking ooh. amazing um, variant that's available on Scout Com Comics website as well. And then a, a, another artist in the business, Stefano Cordicelli, who's another, they're both Italian, Daniel Serra and, and Stefano Cordicelli, did a beautiful, his own style version. And it has Hector looking up at Astra, who's this dream celebrity character also in the book. And so art is really important to me. I love being able in comics to be able to like highlight people that you respect and want and have pull mm -hmm. them into your world and play together. And so I hope some folks check out those variants. I'll be wearing those different shirts throughout the week cool so. very cool um uh we doing good on time what where are we okay good um i'm sure okay it's a comic -Con <laughs> it, it is you know? um okay and you I'll pay for what you get there you go <laughs> and i'm sure people that have uh joined our conversation to this part absolutely want to get this uh graphic novel or i'll go again and I'm sure people that have gone to this far in our conversation want to be part of this world and get this graphic novel and this comic book. Where can people get it? They can get it on Simon Schuster's website. You can okay. pre-order it now. I suggest you do if you really want this book because it could be on back order by mm -hmm. the time it publishes September mm -hmm. 18th, September between September 18th and September mm -hmm. 20th. It's going to officially be out and available. Um, so I and I also encourage you to kind of order through your bookstores or your, let them know now mm -hmm. you'd like this book, get it on hand. Mm -hmm. um, we want to support our bookstores. If enough people order through a bookstore, I may come into town and do a signing and talk more about this. And um, and if I can bring my the artists involved, uh, I know Derek Robertson and I have talked about maybe doing something up in San Francisco, close to where he lives. Mm -hmm. So we'll be doing the tour. I'm planning on hitting a few other Comic Cons, like New York Comic Con, and possibly the Comic Con, the Rose City one up, up in um, uh, Portland. So, uh, but yeah, that's how Simon Schuster is where you get the book. Scott, um, so Scout Comics, mm -hmm. ScoutComics.com, um, I think it is, but Scout Comics is website. Um, there's a tile for E Junkie. They can get anything. All these variants I talked about, mm -hmm. the limited issues, the um, inked version by. Da uh, uh, Derek Robertson that doesn't have color. All these limited issues. They're doing like a 1,200 print, a 200 print, oh, medals. Wow. Um, nice. You know, if this thing becomes the movie, I think it will be, and the TV series, I think it will be. I've had some pretty big producers already ask for the book. Mm -hmm. um, get it now. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, that just the just short description really sucks you in, and you want to know more. So uh, very well could be a movie, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So that's great. And uh, uh, Nicholas Tanna, creator of E-Junkie, thank you so much for joining us on Thinking Outside the Long Box. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. And that'll do it for us at uh, San Diego Comic-Con.